Mr. Derek Veenhoff. He's better known as Deke. Not drinking liquor with DJ Deke, we out laughing. No. Yeah, Deke. We are here with Dr. Kevin Folta once again. Welcome back to the show. Hey, yeah, thank you. It's really fun to be back. Um, so last time we went over the basics of GMOs and the different criticisms and uh, uh, technology and that sort of thing. And this time I wanted to kind of maybe analyze a few things in the news and, and some geopolitical things and maybe some gene editing um, um, stuff. So what's new in your world uh, with your work? Is there any new updates uh, uh in that department well the big problem for us is we've hit the pinata just right and now we're trying to pick up candy and uh, don't have enough hands to do uh, the work that needs to be done and we have three major projects in the lab and um, all three of them are producing and so it's a lot of lab time for me which is exciting I'm hiring lots of undergraduates who I normally um, you know you would normally have one or two on deck but we've got half a dozen and they're all awesome so we're doing a lot and i think the big excitement is we're understanding the genes that control uh, strawberry fruit traits really well and um, coming up with some new candidates for molecules that regulate the way plants grow so really exciting stuff so what are there objectives in your mind for the work or are you just sort of taking it step by step and seeing where it leads or well, our, our goal is to really have a, a functional map of what every gene in strawberry does. And the main drivers are fruit quality because that's what consumers care about and that's what our industry is excited to improve. And so we have some brilliant, brilliant people working on this and um, a pile of papers in the queue. Um, that's exciting stuff. But this new molecule discovery is a project that um, I can't find funding for. Um, it's, uh, government agencies aren't excited about it. And, um, it, it just has been a real slow grind trying to sh get people enthusiastic about this project that we just love. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I think it'll happen with time. Is that because strawberries are boring or like, are they not, uh, <laughs> are they not a, you know, a staple crop or something like that, that would make them more exciting to say a government or some sort of funding? Well, that is to, true to some degree. Most of our funding for strawberry work comes from the strawberry industry because they're curious how they can better compete with Mexico and all the challenges they face as an industry. But um, the work in the new molecule discovery is all being done in the lab plant Arabidopsis. And this is work that is identifying new molecules that could be the next generation of herbicides or the next generation of um flower inhibitors or flower activators it's a really cool project we published in 2017 and um really keys on the idea of putting random sequence into plants so just like you would put in a gene to control a trait we put in random dna sequence and see what happens and uh it's really cool because stuff happens <laughs> mm. um i was just learning a bit about what they call what some people call actually i don't not the technical term, but like when you shoot DNA into the other organism, does you do you actually use gold? Is gold actually used? Gold molecules or? Um... Yeah, actually, you're 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 talking about what is really ancient technology right now with what they called biolistics, and the idea was you could coat small particles like uh, particles of gold, particles of um, tungsten that were just a couple of uh, micrometers across and fire these using an explosive charge originally, a, a 22 cartridge, propel them into tissue. And once in a while, the gold particles with the DNA that was coating them would fall off, and would, the cell would go, oh, here's some DNA laying around. Maybe we better put this in the nucleus where it belongs. You know, I'll shove it in the chromosome. And uh, it would happen, and it would happen with some frequency. It was later replaced, the same technology, instead of using a 22 um, car, um, a bullet technically a primer um, we switched to helium and you would use a burst of helium that would propel the, the particles and it was much more uniform and predictable it still is not a very good way to get the job done uh, okay 
So you can't use Bitcoin to shoot uh, DNA into something else, but you can use gold. That's okay. right. It, it was exceedingly expensive experiments. <laughs> <laughs> Makes sense. Um, yeah, one thing I wanted to talk to you about is, uh, I don't know how familiar you are with uh, the, the Chinese scientist who is under fire right now for uh, the first apparent uh, CRISPR baby. Or the set of twins, I think, or something like that. And he says they're the third one on the way. Um, not too m many news articles out about it. There is one in the Times, um, a few other ones. But there's uh, apparently no peer-reviewed um, information yet. And they say he's under house arrest. And, and there's, there's sort of opinions about that or wh whether the state of China is actually maybe in on it. Do you have any opinion or have you read about this yet? I've read about it, and I haven't gone too deep into it, but one thing that is pervasive in the Chinese scientific culture is the desire to be first. And whenever you review a paper from China, it'll always say, you know, here we describe for the first time the enzyme that catalyzes A to B. And it, it, there's such um, a bravado that goes along with explaining scientific results. And I think it's cultural. And I think it's because it's extremely competitive and the government does incentivize um, uh, with personal financing scientific discovery. So here's somebody who um, maybe jumped the gun a little bit in terms of using the tools before the ethical framework was in place to use them correctly or, you know, with oversight. And uh, obviously, you know, I mean, maybe he did it and you know, the first folks who figured out fire got in big trouble, too. You know, a few of them got burned, probably burned down a house, burned down a village. But we can sit today in retrospect and be very grateful that somebody was courageous enough to take those steps. Um, it could be the case here. You know, somebody um, broke the seal on human research that can be beneficial. I mean, obviously, if these kids are resistant to the HIV virus, uh, you know, maybe we're on to something. Mm -hmm. But you, you, you understand, I mean, it's easy to understand that this is maybe a little premature with respect towards proper oversight. Right. Was there the same amount of fear and concern with in vitro fertilization? I, I think so. And I remember back, uh, you know, that there, there were babies that were having heart transplants. You know, baby Faye was a famous one. And the first... Um, in vitro fertilized children, people talked about how there would be birth defects and malformities and how this was playing God. And, you know, it was very, very parallel. And more recently, the triparental birth, where they took the cell from one mother, the, the, the genetic information from another, and then fertilized that. You know, that received some uh, criticism, too. So this is just the next step. I do believe it was a little premature because of the awesome potential impact of this technology. I hate to see it get set back because, yeah. you know, public public opinion or a mistake. Yeah, I mean, there seems to be, uh, you know, different uh, scientists who were either working with them or who supposedly knew of it. And some of them, you know, got real freaked out and, and asked him not to involve them and, and this and that and but uh, anyway, a little interesting um, when you look at China as a government and what they may or may not be be aware of in that situation and uh, what's really going on with the guy. Uh, but um, <laughs> well, you, know, you, you it, it's easy to end up being a hero or a zero over there. You know, you and it all depends mostly on perception. I think if the world would have said, "Here is a guy who solved this problem," and um, you know, we all should be excited about it. If the world, you know, was very accepting of this, this guy would have been a hero and China would be having parades for the guy. Mm. But I think it's when you, uh, you know, he, he kind of skipped the beat and that didn't wash terribly well overall. Yeah, I guess the father had HIV. That was that was the claim by this gentleman. Yeah, I don't know much about the other details. I, yeah. I kind of steered clear of this one a little bit because... <laughs> It, it was one of these things that, you know, I, I stick my my uh, neck out on getting excited or apprehensive of this. I think it's I'm playing the middle of the road, especially because the details are so sketchy. Totally. Yeah, it's a little early to tell, right? Um, one thing, another geopolitical thing I was reading about is that Putin and Russia and, and their 
banning of GMOs uh, and their claim that they he wants to be, I think, the world's largest producer of non-GMO foods. Is that just a tit-for-tat Russia-U.S. thing? And and is that another situation where he they might be actually using the technology but not being forthcoming about it? It, it may be the case. I think the uh, you know Russia certainly is a massive wheat producer and um, does compete with the U.S. for some major markets. And whether you're talking about China, South Korea, Japan, um, other markets in the world, uh, Ukraine, uh, well Russia proper, they are massive producers of wheat and and other grains. And uh, to create that differentiation by saying um, we're not going to produce using genetic engineering and uh, oh by the way the technology is probably not safe anyway and you're all going to die you know it's it they're playing the same card that activist groups do here in the states you know this is torn right from the playbook of you know friends of the earth and greenpeace and us right to know you well know? there's allegations that there's some of these groups are also sort of tied in with the kremlin right is that not is that not the case you know, I don't know. Those, I have no evidence that I. Or is find that the credible. same thing that they say about you, but on the other side, right? <laughs> it's kind of putting the yeah. It's kind of putting the uh, the shoe on the other foot. I yeah. I think that we have to be extremely careful with, uh, you know, pointing our fingers. But there has been very clear, definitive evidence from social media that Russia has meddled in U.S. affairs with respect towards um, maligning genetic engineering. And the technology. That's for certain. That's a great work that came out of Iowa State University, just in understanding how people made decisions about genetic engineering. Yeah, and I mean, that ties in with all these troll farms and, and the election stuff, too, right? And similar tactics by, uh, by Russia. Well, very similar, because it, when it's so easy to control a population by giving them uh, information that skews their perception and erodes their trust in their own government. And I don't mean to get conspiratorial, but if you go back through history, if you want to change people's opinion towards their government, uh, you erode the trust. And eroding the trust in the food supply and saying everything you're eating is poison, it's just the EPA in the back pocket of big business, you know, there's people here that seriously believe that. And... Uh, if you can if you can teach people that their food isn't good, think about the uh, razor's edge you're on with respect towards um, food security where, you know, we have a hurricane and the store shelves are empty. You tell people that their food isn't any good and now all of a sudden things are real iffy real quick. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned wheat. <laughs> Is wheat not allowed? I read something here. I don't know if I got this mixed up. Wheat is not allowed to be grown, or GMO wheat is not approved to be grown anywhere commercially. That's correct. Yeah, uh, GM wheat, which um, would be glyphosate resistant and potentially some insect resistant wheat, is not currently grown anywhere, as far as I know. Mm -hmm. um, it is a. Um, it's been done. Farmers would like it. Uh, farmers in Canada and uh, the U.S. think it's a great innovation. There may be some reports here and there anecdotally of it being grown in Ukraine, but um, there's no um, commercial wheat that we know is being grown, and that's purely to protect markets and trade. Uh, I, I read this one article that was talking about, I think it was last year, last summer, uh, some Canadian GM wheat was found in some uh, South Korea uh, or Japanese um, um, wheat, and it was like, how, how do you, th how how does one think about that situation? How does a layman understand? Uh, how how does this happen? How does some get in and and that sort of thing? And why and why such a? I think they stop taking it for the next six months. They must put some sort of small sanction on the. On the income of, of it or how does that work well as far as i'm aware there's been two cases where rogue herbicide tolerant wheat has shown up where it didn't belong and one of them was in oregon another one of them was in alberta and both of these cases were um, examples where um a or just a farmer out on a field or or somebody from the county or whatever um, was out applying herbicide and here's some wheat that didn't die. 
And the last one, I think, was near a road in Alberta in the middle of nowhere. And it seemed kind of fishy because why is this person spraying these plants? And then why would they notice one that didn't die? When they went back and looked at the specific kind of wheat, it was they knew exactly where it came from, who made it, when the last time it was trialed. Because they did have some controlled on-farm trials of this stuff um, years ago, you know, probably 15 years ago, and um, never sold it commercially. And here's the same exact wheat showing up years later. It kind of suggests sabotage or um, somebody from within the company or in the farm having some wheat and deciding to create an event. Mm. Um, Well, they would find that because... Uh, someone would have to plant it, someone would have to grow it, and someone would have to find it. Or, or You'd have to apply the herbicide and then find it. There's right. my dog in the background. <laughs> but um, I'm outside. It's Florida. It's uh, winter, so it's a good time to sit outside for a podcast. But It seems like nice weather. It's it's. We just had a cold snap here in um, Ontario, part of the, the Midwest, same thing, and it's like 15 degrees now. All of a sudden, it was negative 15 the other day. It was crazy. Yeah, we're we're sitting right now at, at probably plus fifteen Celsius, and it's uh it's beautiful night out here tonight. Um, Early but, spring, yeah. Yeah, but um, but my my dog gets excited because I live out on a farm and there's a uh, a lot of critters that walk around here at night and he gets pretty excited. So, <laughs> cool. Any UFOs or anything weird out there? Um, all the time. You know, there no actually. <laughs> We are a UFO safe house, so uh, they know to come here. It's actually the, the 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 strangest things that you will ever find that would rival aliens or Bigfoot or whatever are found in north central rural Florida. <laughs> so right. I, I I live in the hotbed. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so let's see here. One question I had was about monoculture. Um, and does that just mean the planting of one crop versus um, crop rotating? And why is that a concern for uh, GM critics? Is it also a concern for just GM scientists? Like, uh, could you explain monoculture to us? And- yeah, so monoculture is is not just one kind of plant, but one uniform kind of genetics. So it's even worse than saying corn. It's one kind of corn, um, one specific genotype you know or one specific type of corn and i'll give you a better example the uh, russet potato you know it's been the potato of commerce the major potato since the 1870s and when you grow this you grow massive fields of russet potatoes um, when you grow um, a great example is wine grapes so the um, cabernet grapes um, famous in france it's all from one clone one identical set of genetics, just like that russet potato. The problem is when disease comes or a pest, now there's no uh, variation in tolerance to that disease. To defend against that, yeah. And, and, and the entire thing dies. Right. That's why the grape industry crashed so bad in France back years ago was because they had one type of genetics because that's all that's acceptable for that kind of wine. So when we talk about monocultures, we think of things like the potato or the banana is another great example. The Cavendish banana is the exclusive banana of commerce, right? It's the one we all eat. But that banana is under attack. It's all clones, millions and millions of acres of, of clones. And they're all under attack by a, by a fungus that is a clone, so it's a clone killing a clone. Wow. It, you, you can't make this stuff up. But that's what happens when you have a monoculture is you have no genetic diversity to instill um, natural resistance. Those are the major examples. Now, when people talk about genetic engineering, they use monoculture because it, it's an easy criticism to make. You're growing massive fields of soybeans or corn or sugar beets, you know, something like that. It doesn't wash the same way because russet potatoes, um, uh, uh, Cabernet grapes, and Cavendish bananas are all genetically uniform. A field of corn may be genetically uniform, but the next field is different. And the next field is different because different farmers grow different hybrids. Even on one farm, you may grow three or four different hybrids. Or different types of corn, so it, it's doesn't. It's a good argument, 
it's not necessarily as valid with genetically engineered crops as it is with other plants. And the reason it matters is because it limits genetic diversity on the farm. And, uh, you know, we're sitting in Florida and you're seeing the, the decimation of a citrus industry because of a very narrow genetic um, resource, very, genet- very narrow genetics of citrus um, that, are, that can't resist the diseases. So, but it's a purposeful defense by, by a farmer to try to ensure the biodiversity. They're not just going to willy-nilly plant the exact same genetic. So, h- help me understand then, how, how did the, remind me again, how did the grape, uh, the Cabernet thing happen? Like, didn't, didn't, don't they try to mitigate that from the get-go? Or well, how, how do they is- fall into that situation? These are ancient situations and ancient, um, I mean, I, this is probably, I don't know how far it goes back now. It's a while, but they had problems with nematodes. So soil worms and, um, were able to mitigate that by using North American rootstocks on their, on their grapes. So this was, um, you know, years ago that they were able to do this and they still grow monocultures because grape is a great example. Consumers who drink wine don't want a new grape. Ah, right. They want the Cabernet grape grown in Cabernet conditions on a Cabernet and uh, total resistance to something new and exciting. Uh, Grape breeders are upset about that. On the flip side, you have something like bananas where uh, the, we had a banana called the Gros Michel or big Mike gross Michael. Um, That was the major banana for years. It's the one that if you talk to grandparents, they go, Oh yeah, that thing. Yeah. That was great banana. That one got wiped out by disease, except in the Congo and in my backyard. <laughs> I got one. Um, and um, uh, there are, but the one that replaced it was again a clone. So these uh, monocultures work because there's one type of management, uniform flowering, uniform production of fruit, very predictable. But the soft white underbelly is you have no defense to disease except for possibly lots of uh, pesticide or something to protect it. Okay, right. Interesting. Uh, glyph- glyphosate is still still under attack, still sort of in the ethos out there. Um, what is, maybe could you start with the one thing that's brought up a lot, which is the IARC's probable carcinogenic uh, category, the group 2A classification by the World Health Organization's International Agency for Research on Cancer, right? What what was the controversy there? There was some, I got me deep in the weeds trying to uh, figure it out. Um, yeah, this, <laughs> well, this is fun. Uh, glyphosate is a remarkably safe chemical, extremely low toxicity to animals, uh, incredible toxicity to plants. And it's because it interferes with the metabolism of a specific pathway that's required for metabolism that plants have that we don't. And wow, how cool. You can target a specific aspect of plant biology. And um, the chemical itself, we know exactly how it works. We know what enzyme it inhibits. We know its toxicity in animals. It's been studied for years. It's been examined for years by all the companies that make it. There's probably two dozen companies that manufacture it um probably a couple dozen governments have analyzed it and determined it is safe for use for municipalities for farmers for um for home home you know for residential and to get residential clearance you have to be an extremely safe chemical um you can't give anything to consumers because consumers are pretty dim you have to give them things that are pretty much foolproof and glyphosate was a great example so all of anyone who's looked at this thing critically including academic scientists including government regulators everybody who's looked at it 800 peer-reviewed papers have said this is a safe chemical you know within limits you can't you know drink it concentrated and it's irritant above a certain level or whatever so the activists, anti-GMO activists, couldn't stop people from buying seeds and couldn't get regulators to stop the seeds. So go after the treatment that you use on the seeds, which is this herbicide that kills the weeds. Doesn't kill the plant, you know, the, the soy or the 
corn, but it kills the weeds. So um, go, they create this risk. It's manufactured risk around glyphosate. And they do it by going back through the literature and finding these barely significant examples of where it suggested some sort of toxicity. And one paper from 2003 showed a barely statistically relevant association with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And so that, plus looking at some papers that weren't terribly good, that were missing controls, that had just inferences that maybe something was going on, were the basis of the IARC decision. And it is laughable to any scientist that looks at it. Um, there's great papers which critically examine the IARC decision and totally dismantle it. But to um, lawyers and to activists and to people writing books and selling books on the subject, this was the best thing that could happen. Because now you have the IARC saying, well, this might probably to yeah. occupational um, be a carcinogen. It doesn't say it is. It says there's enough data out there that if you use it as you're supposed to, eh, maybe it's something you got to worry about. Is that kind of reckless though? Like what, I don't get that. Like why, like, I know there's this list here of 116 things that are probably carcinogenic and, um, you know, there's all kinds of things here. You, you read these different uh, articles all the time, but is there just because that's such a recent um finding so to speak 2015 i think that was that is there going to would you anticipate a revision of that by the world health organization or because i always look at the who as kind of a aren't they a golden standard or is there a lot there going on that i we should know more about like like how the that group operates and how the science is checked out in that no it is good and the w world health organization has said that when used as um, as directed, it is unlikely to be carcinogenic. That's what the World Health Organization said because the IARC screwed up so bad. Um, the IARC was influenced uh, financially that Chris Portier, the main uh, person on the IARC running this, was paid $160,000 by the people who would eventually litigate the glyphosate claims. So here's a little bit of influence that they forgot to mention. They left out the most powerful study of over 55,000 farmers where there's absolutely zero association between glyphosate and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Any place where they showed that it was not an association, they omitted from the report. So it was a real sleazy operation here. The IARC is generally trustworthy, but... Couple of bad it, apples. Well, the bad apples are are in the glyphosate story. If you're talking about how they say uh, in the same group two carcinogen, group two A is like pickled vegetables, and, and and so what it means is is that based upon very conservative estimates of risk, exposure to pickled vegetables or red meat or night shift work. Or working as a hairdresser, coffee or whatever. Uh, yeah, is is a is a uh, possible or probable carcinogen. You yeah, know, to me, probable sounds like the wrong word. If if that's, you know, it seems more like probable makes you feel like the it's leading to a yes, like it's gonna. Well, well, well uh, you 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 probably won the lottery. <laughs> <laughs> right. I mean, you know, you bought the ticket, and 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 so where it's where probable. where. Yeah, yeah it, it's it, probable. Well, it's, well, it, well, it gets into possible and probable, right? Mm -hmm. It is, it is probable. Yeah, but it's not kind of likely. a language thing. It's kind of, <laughs> but that that is interesting to me. Is language itself sometimes gets us tripped up, right? Because we have these preconceived notions of certain words and certain ways things are said. It can kind of, if you already have a propensity to believe something, certain wording of something, uh, if you don't read into it, might, you know, give you the wrong idea, kind of thing. Oh, absolutely. And, and, and that's why the IARC uh, bins of, you know, certainly carcinogenic, probable carcinogen, possible carcinogen and not carcinogenic are so, so uh, narrow. And, you know, it's a starting point. And it's saying that to start to assess risk, if you want to really assess risk, 
you got to go into the individual peer reviewed papers. And if you go into all of the different papers over 40 years, there has not been one paper that definitively links it to uh, to cancer in humans, all the epidemiological data, um, the data that showed this minor association, the way they got to that was they gave farmers a, a survey and said, tell us about the diseases you suffer from and the products that you used. And they found this very, very slight association that if you use glyphosate, maybe you had non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. So the same group gave farmers, um, they did what was called a cohort study, they found a whole bunch of farmers of similar age and similar uh, occupation and all that stuff and said, okay, starting today, we're going to go forward and we know your health, we know the products you use, and we're going to go forward and monitor what you use and the diseases you get. And there was absolutely no association. So the more powerful study didn't reinforce that association. And then the best studies show, don't show it either. But the IARC took those few little association, barely statistically significant. They bundled those with um, kind of poor quality studies that showed that you could damage DNA and um, mess with cells in a dish and said, aha, here's something. It's probable, well, maybe right. a, a probable carcinogen. And this is the kind of stuff that leads to this one particular case. I forget the gentleman's name, but the the two hundred eighty nine million settlement uh, for in California that Monsanto had to pay this gentleman who had non Hodgkin's lymphoma, which he spilled some Roundup on his leg like twenty or thirty years before, something like that. And you have a jury of citizens that are judging this case. Right. And then, of course, like you said, they bring in scientists and, and, and different different uh, studies and whatnot. But what's the problem with the U.S. Uh, system uh, having a jury like this to to judge cases like this that are so science based? Yeah, well, you're, you're talking about um, Dwayne Johnson. Um, that, not the uh, rock. Not the rock. Um, you know, the groundskeeper from California who, you know, bless his heart. I hope he's all right and I hope he survives this whole thing. I feel so bad for him and his family. Um you know, he's, he is terminally ill and nobody will ever know ever if yeah. glyphosate caused his, uh, cancer. Uh, no one will ever know. And, you know, and we can take an open mind and say, well, maybe he had an extraordinary circumstance where he spilled it on himself and ingested a bunch. And then this was, you know, extraordinary circumstances and, you know, his genetics, um, you know, something about him, who knows? We can't say. The problem is, is that they had a jury look at the data and say, well, it was a major contributor. That was the threshold. Could it be a contributor? And um, a very emotional case, a man dying, um, a big bad company with lots of deep pockets and an insurance company that will pay out, um, it, and very emotional arguments, um, emails that are cherry-picked for information, you know, it's no question. It's no surprise to me that a, that a jury would find for him. Um, they did it with leaky breast implants back in the 1980s uh, or 90s, and uh, bankrupted a company. You know, at Dow Corning, that they they didn't show any evidence that this caused autoimmune disease in women. And here we are, 20 years later, and there's absolutely no evidence. And we see that the jury was wrong. But, you know, these things right now, um, you know, you, you look at them and, you know, should we have juries deciding scientific issues where, science, where the science is very well established? You know, should we have somebody, um, you know, I, I, you know I, 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 it, it's hard to make a good analogy there. Um, should we have juries making those decisions? I don't, I don't think so. Yeah, or what do you do? Have another official that's sort of part of the judicial system, but he's a scientist of some level, or like what you know? I don't know. I don't know how you fix that. Yeah, I, I don't. I don't know. I think the big problem is is that until you can trust experts, uh, that's the problem with society as a whole right now. We don't trust experts, and you know, as an expert. It breaks my heart because I could sort this out, <laughs> um, but you know the it's it's a question of trust, and I and I understand why it's not there. You know we did we haven't earned it in the right way, and we've lost it in a lot of ways. 
And so that's really what we're up against. And the Johnson case is just a residue of that. Um, should should GM food products be labeled? This is what we in North America we don't have currently, right? We don't have um, uh, legality surrounding or regulations surrounding the labeling in the EU. They do mostly, and then in South America, uh, it's sort of yes and no in different places. Uh, what is should should there be labeling? Should there yeah, not, or what would labeling look like? This is something that I think about a lot, and it's mostly because what is and you said the phrase GM food. What is GM food? And you have plants that are genetically engineered that produce some sort of product. And sugar beet is a great example. A genetically engineered sugar beet makes sugar. Same sugar, same sugar as the other sugar. You can't tell it apart. Uh, sugar beet from a sugar from a non-genetically engineered sugar beet or a genetically engineered sugar is identical. Um, oil from a genetically engineered soybean and a non-genetically engineered soybean, it's, it's pretty much, you would have to be very, very hard pressed to find DNA or protein, so the stuff that makes it genetically engineered, in that oil. Because that all goes away and during the processing. So is that food GMO? I mean, you, there's nothing in there that... that it, so what it means is that we are, regular, we are trying to label a process and not a product. And that's a really important distinction. If the products are equivalent, how does it, why does it matter where it comes from? Well, some people will say, well, I want to know if it's genetically engineered because I disagree with the companies that do it and all that. Eh, I guess I kind of see that argument. But if we're going to be talking about labels on food, it should be about consumer safety. It should be about, um, and that's the current law. If it affects safety, label it. And that's with um, allergens. It's with um, you know different chemicals that may be there. You have to say they're there. But to 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 differentiate the process by which it was made is kind of silly. There's right. no information there. The big problem with having government do that is now you have to create a government agency that is going to track that sugar beet from the farm through the supply chain, through the processing, right. to that bag of sugar. Now, that's, that's expensive, not, right? It, that's more that's, costly. That's not going to be free. Uh, the government doesn't do these things well, and when it does it, it costs a lot of money. And so why are we going to create a brand new bureaucracy to verify that the stuff that's in a bag of sugar that's equivalent to the sugar that comes from somewhere else is coming from a plant that isn't the plant that people don't like. Is that food, would that uh, cost pass on to the, the food uh, products themselves? Oh, like with the pricing? Oh, absolutely. By that? Yeah. It would go to the consumer. It would also go to the taxpayer who pays for government agencies to be created and, and be enforced. And then how do you litigate when you find um, uh, sugar that you feel uh, if somebody raises the complaint that they got uh, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma because it was a genetically engineered plant. Now you got a regulatory agency involved. You got, um, you know, it, it, it would be such a mess. And I think there's a lot better things we should be spending taxpayer money on. And uh, education, infrastructure, health care. These are things that need money desperately in, in North America, you know, U.S. and Canada. And why are we even thinking about creating a whole nother layer of government to protect us from nothing? Yeah. Uh, the skeptic uh, from Skeptoid, Brian Dunning, is coming on the show uh, this week. And he had a good question that made me think is what, how would you how would you lay if you were to label them? Would it be a skull and crossbones or like a smiley sun face? Like <laughs> then that's a whole other debate of, you know, let's say we're going to label them. What? How are we going to label them? And how do other countries label just text on the on the label? It like, varies. Yeah, it yeah. varies. Um, it, in a lot of cases, it's got a little um, G in China. They put a little G on it or something. Um, here on the back of labels, it says may contain genetically engineered ingredients. And if the food industry got its act together, 
as I told them years ago, do it voluntarily. Put on the label, made with genetically engineered ingredients, not GMO, not whatever, made with genetically engineered, or made from a genetically engineered plant. You see how he's getting the words again, right? Yes, exactly. It's because the ingredients aren't genetically engineered. The ingredients are the same, same ingredients. Same ingredients, yep. yep. <laughs> yeah. and, uh, and so... Well, I don't know. I was pretty good at the Pepsi challenge, so I think I might be able to tell the difference. <laughs> well, well, say hi to Brian Dunning for me, because Brian's awesome. I've been a Skeptoid fan for a long time. Yeah, me and, too. I was, I'm was. i amazed that, uh, I mean, even just having you on, I just shoot people a message and see if they'll... Uh, you know, join you on a podcast. It's pretty cool to get in touch with these different people. Well, I, I might be featured in his new movie coming up. Um, what it was science friction. Uh, uh, yes. Yeah. I think we, we did quite a bit of footage for it about two and a half years ago. And, uh, hopefully that'll all come out. Cause that's, it sounds like a great, um, effort. Very but, cool. Yeah. His podcast is great. It's always, um, so many varying topics and he does nice and short, short clips so you can get him in on a commute or that kind of thing. Well, let me jump back to labeling really quick yeah. um, before we label Brian. <laughs> um, th- you know, if you if people are really interested in not buying genetically engineered um, products from genetically engineered plants, they can buy that non-GMO label thing. And the non-GMO label is on, you know, thousands of products and differentiates those that are uh, containing products from gen- ingredients from genetically engineered plants and those that aren't. And I think it's a, a total crock. I think it's horrible. I think it's bad marketing. I think it's companies capitulating to uh, activist interests that don't care about the poor or about the food insecure in the world or the environment. And they're making money off of fear. And um, people can't opt for that. If it has want, made yeah. you know, it's made me a better shopper. When I see the non-GMO project on things that I always used to buy, like Sabra hummus or uh, Triscuit crackers, when I see it now, I go, I'm not buying it anymore. Same. <laughs> People got mad at Triscuits, didn't they? Oh when yeah. They, uh... <laughs> <laughs> well, the commercial was horrible too. It made it was so demeaning. Oh, I didn't actually catch it, but maybe I should look that up. Um, I wanted to uh, jump back to this Aaron Brockovich thing you you had a podcast out a few episodes back where you talked about it and well, this was related to Roundup as well right uh, I was going back through her Wikipedia just to refresh because I never actually saw that movie what's it called again yeah well, it's called Aaron Brockovich oh yeah um, <laughs> clever name yeah um, so the, her initial the case in the movie was actually sort of a example of good activism no was it uh water was it uh mercury in water or something well it was uh chromium hexavalent chromium and you know aaron brockovich is kind of enigmatic she when i look at her website i love what she does by watching um water being really concerned about municipal water sources she's been instrumental in um in the situation in flint michigan um i like that about her the problem is, is that she, uh, you know, when you're a hammer, everything's a nail. And yes. she wrote an article in The Guardian on December 6th saying, the weed killer in your food is killing us. Yeah. <laughs> and that's not true. Because, one, there's no weed killer in your food. There's, like, the residues when they're there are, are infinitesimal. And they're not killing us. There's no evidence to say that. And through the entire article, here's this person who's been touted as a hero who makes up just total BS. She um, says that, oh, when you look at almonds, quinoa, and carrots, you find glyphosate residues in your food. No, you don't. (laughs) There's no data showing that. There's not even a... um, does she try to cite something or does no, she just... no, she just makes it up and then says that there's a definitive link with non Hodgkin's lymphoma. There's not right. And, and um, then it turns out that she's actually uh, a consultant for um, Weitz and Luxembourg, who is a major law firm that's litigating the glyphosate case. <laughs> so she's out drumming up business for these lawyers who are running these, what I think are frivolous lawsuits 
that are an assault on science. So here's Aaron Brockovich, a trusted name, who is making up false information and getting a paycheck for doing it. I mean, that that makes me really mad. I mean, I think it's possible that there can be a person who has um, like some good bones in their body, does some activism, and maybe at a different point in their life they see some money here or some opportunity there or maybe fame or, or a mix of these things. And, uh, you know, one other case that's on our Wikipedia that uh, I think it was in New York City or New York State, at least somewhere. And it it was something she started investigating um, some chemical or she accused she she made up a, a hypothesis of what was going on. And it turns out they blamed it on what they call hysteria. Yeah. Which conversion told- syndrome. OK. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, histrionic conversion syndrome. Yeah. It's, this was in uh, New York State where a number of girls uh, made claims about having illness after being exposed to some, I remember it's about maybe four years ago and, um, it turned out to be nothing, but, <laughs> but it, but there, but it is a legitimate psychological phenomenon yeah, that when hysteria. you have, a, yeah, you have a group of people that you convince them that, um, uh, there's something, some sort of factor that should be making them ill or maybe making them ill. Um, it's a kind of confirmation bias. You start to, Oh, wait a minute. My joints are achy. You know, maybe I am having a headache, you know? Mm-hmm. And, um, she was all over that and all over the media and blew it. Mm-hmm. But this is why scientists need to make these decisions and need to follow these cases. We're trained to not be self-deceived. And what, she's looking at is you know what what someone like Aaron Brockovich does is say well what evidence do I have that makes me believe that this is dangerous whereas I might say how can I do the strongest test to convince myself that this is dangerous or that this is not dangerous I'm sorry I misphrased that how can I do the strongest test to convince myself that this is not dangerous or no not safe (laughs) <laughs> see, see, I, hypothesis formulation is tricky. What I'm doing is doing the most rigorous test to prove that what I believe is wrong. Right. That's the right way to say it. Because the that, best test you can come up with will help you lead to what is not false. Right? That's because right. the more I, rigorous te- the testing, um, does that make sense? That's right. I, I don't want to be wrong. So I'm going to challenge my synthesis and challenge my interpretations challenge my beliefs as as stringently as i can i'm going to design the biggest test the best test the biggest test to show that what i think is totally wrong yeah that way you can be sure be sure that it's that it's right if you've tested it as rigorously as possible to the nth degree just 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 keep testing it or that's right. So, so when the data come and, and they say, all right, in this rigorous test, we find no data that support that conclusion. I go, that's great. You know, then then we then what we do is we come we report that and then we come up with an even tougher test. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so that's different than the way that uh, Brockovich and others work where they go, well, we're going to look for the slightest association and we're going to run with it because that confirms what we want to believe. Yeah. And and that's the difference between scientists and laymen with respect to thinking and, you know, why, you know, why I can be, you know, an, an arrogant scientist and say, you know, the folks on those juries don't know what they're talking about. Yeah. Um, you know, we're, we're trained in the in in ensuring that we don't self-deceive. Hmm. And, and that's a really important part about being a scientist. I feel like there needs to be some more convergence from this. From the science community and the the layman's, there's a lot of there's a lot of convergence, but there's also, and I think social media has a big part to play in this too. And it's just like in the political world, it's a lot of my side versus your side and short bursts of information, and not a lot of sitting down with each other and saying, well, "What are your concerns?" And here's here's how I can address those concerns. Just because we're all human, right? We need to all <laughs> just figure this out. We're all we all have the same concerns. It's safety, you know, well being. This and yeah. that, and uh, there should be hopefully sometime in the future, there's some sort of convergence with all this no, stuff. No, you're exactly right, and and the thing is though, with what you're talking about, um, that's not the realm where scientists normally operate, right? We don't yeah. ask what are your concerns, and the the other big difference is that in politics, you can 
uh, you know, have sex with a porn star, pay people off not to talk about it. You can say things that are offensive. You can do whatever you want. And tomorrow the news cycle forgets. Yeah. In science, I publish a paper that's got um, information that others dispute, and that looks bad. If I publish, you know, and that's good science. Like if I do the experiments and someone does a better experiment and say you're wrong, okay, that's the course of science. That's fine. But if I publish false information or say something that is um, uh, not consistent with the data or an interpretation that is influenced by some company or whatever, it's career death. You're done. That's stuff that leads to retractions and you're never hired again. You don't get grants anymore. You don't get students. You don't get opportunities to talk on a podcast. I mean, you're you're done unless you're Andrew Wakefield. <laughs> yeah, I heard he's got a new Netflix special uh, oh, documentary of some it's kind. And, and uh, yeah, I had um, uh, yeah, I saw that on was it Reddit or something where they're t- I think the skeptic section of Reddit was trying to get a petition signed or something to talk to Netflix to to get that because he's his information or his um, theories of have led to a lot of anti-vaxxer stuff, right? And children actually dying. Oh, sure. I'm, I'm so glad you went into this because, yeah, he um, th- it's a very compelling documentary. The one Vaxxed is what it's called. Very compelling, very emotional. Um, something that if you watch this without a scientific background, you would go, all right, I'm not getting vaccinated. Maybe I have autism from it. You know, I mean, people would seriously question their own health and uh, well-being of their families after watching that it's lies and distortion and it is egregious yeah i can't believe netflix has something like that on there i um, i don't know if they've taken it down or what the situation is i am not sure but that's kind of interesting well well you know it's funny that you bring this up because in 2005 i used to have arguments with a local anti-vaxxer here she was on um Penn and Teller show, and uh, she's very vocal about vaccines causing problems. And in 2005, I used to think if we could only do the experiment and have one group of kids not vaccinated and another set that would be vaccinated, we would learn very quickly if it mattered. And then I thought, you know, but that's just so unethical. You could never do that. I mean, who would possibly... And they um, did the study for you? (laughs) (laughs) Those parents did the study. They did it. And um, now we are seeing the effects. And when you look in what's happening in Washington, uh, Washington State and uh, Portland area, um, you're looking at uh, there was like now 47 kids that now have measles, a disease that we didn't have in 2000. It was gone from the U.S. Mm -hmm. And and only. Um, and all of them have have either not been vaccinated or have no records of being vaccinated. Yeah, thirty two so, of those, thirty two of tw- uh, twenty five cases involving children under ten, thirty two of those affected have not been immuni- immunized. And the numbers are up from that. You know, you're oh, looking. Oh, okay, I'm looking. Yeah, little stale numbers. I mean, huh. this is they did the experiment and they said we're not going to vaccinate kids, and now those kids are <sighs> infected with measles, and. The problem is, is that now you have um, mothers in Oregon saying, I got a six month old. He can't be vaccinated yet. Can I go outside? You know, am I allowed to leave the house? Because this is in the air and it's a highly contagious disease that if it infects an infant can lead to permanent neurological damage, blindness, um, cognitive impairment. Uh, deafness, uh, pneumonia that can be life-threatening if not fatal. Now there are parents who are sitting and in, in seeing that my nutcase neighbor who decided not to jab her kid is now a threat to my own child. And the good news is that mothers do pass some immunity that, you know, through their blood, they will pass from their um, MMR vaccine or possibly if they had exposure. Okay, that makes sense. I didn't know that. that yeah, yeah that, that, but that lasts a few months. The ones I worry about are the anti-vax mothers who are 19 and 20 years old. And, you know, the young mothers who weren't vaccinated, who never had exposure, who don't have the antibodies, those children are at serious risk. 
And this is where we really start. So we're, we're, we started out talking about genetic engineering and, you know, here's technology that can change the way farmers grow plants and availability to people in need. Here is another case where we are ignoring the science and now we're seeing the social cost of ignoring the science because children are becoming ill. And, and, you know, granted, we can monitor and we're pretty good at, you know, watching children so they don't develop uh, encephalopathies and, um, or I'm sorry, encephalitis or um, uh, pneumonia, which are the two major drawbacks of measles infection. But um, now it brings it into the realm. And uh, in Humboldt County, California, I mean, you're looking at very low ex, uh, um, inoculation rates. Texas is remarkably low. And you're going to see this get a lot worse before it gets better. Dangerous, dangerous stuff. Misinformation, disinformation, and all the rest of it. Um, I wanted to jump over to one, one, one of the final topics here. Um, farmer suicide in India. Are you familiar with the conversation around, around that phenomena? Yeah, extremely. Um, very well versed in this particular um, discussion. We actually talked about it with one of the experts in, in this on my podcast on episode, uh, I think, 43 and 44, a uh, long time ago. Um, the bottom line is, is that suicide is a reality in the developing world, especially among agricultural um, around farmers. It is in this country around farmers. It's it just, sorry, just it's not um, it's not an exorbitant percentage of farmer suicides in India. Is that correct? Is it generally speaking a similar percentage to farmers in say other countries? Is it kind of one of those things where it's magnified and we think that there's a higher percentage? It's really just a lot of population because it's such a populated country. Yeah, I guess there's a couple different things here. Uh, suicide is is a little more prevalent in India, quite a bit more prevalent in India than it is here, and there's many reasons for that. Um, there are um, women who are assaulted that, because of the assault, um, commit suicide. And you, and you see the largest sector of suicides in India are among young women and can be traced back to those kind of events. Um, there's not adequate mental health care in many places. In the U.S., you have a higher incidence of um, suicides among farmers because of the nature of farming. And because of a lack of mental health care in rural areas, um, farming, you are at the mercy of the environment. And in India, uh, farmers were sold seeds for in cotton or other crops. And then we talk about GM. It's only cotton in India. BT and, cotton, right? Yeah, it's BT. So it's insect resistant. And so these uh, farmers, when things are good, you have cotton that grows great. You can protect. It protects itself from insects. You spray much less insecticide than you previously had to do. And you profited from that. And the data that come from uh, studies like Cathage and Came uh, uh, 2012 and other uh, economic analyses of India show that the BT cotton does tremendous things for households. The problem is, is that if... In India, you're reliant on monsoonal rain, and you don't have irrigation in most places. And if you plant cotton, whether it's BT cotton, whatever cotton you want, and that rain doesn't come, it's not going to grow, and you're and you're busted. You sold, you bought the seeds, sometimes the most expensive seeds because the BT ones do cost more, and now you're you have debt, and your family has debt. And the only way out for a lot of these folks is the suicide route. And um, it's extremely sad because not only are people committing suicide because of, uh, you know, because of uh, circumstances in farming. The sad part makes it worse is that here in the United States, activists exploit that. Yeah. And they um, they say, well, look at the farmer suicide because of genetic engineering. No, look at farmer suicide because of um, food insecurity 
and 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 you know cotton obviously isn't food but these folks who are there are doing anything they can to get the best technology to care for their families because it's an economic means right yeah it's a, it's an economic means it's the way to do better so that their families can go to school that right. you can have a better house that you can maybe have security next year and damn if i was over there and i and i was a poor farmer i would roll the dice too and 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 so you know you and you would work as hard as you could and you would say this year i'm going to buy the expensive seeds i'm going to do everything i can to have a great crop and send my kid to university and then the rain doesn't come you can't control that and um and yeah. you know I, I i my heart goes out to those folks and i wish that you know there was a way that that they did have you know technology that could help but um but it, it happens and so there are a lot of there are suicides the bottom line is is that the suicide rates were the same before and after genetic engineering mm. and so um there's no causal relationship between genetic engineering and farmer suicide i would assume that's probably not 100 percent true because the seeds probably cost more yeah, they try to say that it exacerbates the the, the previous conditions. That well, I I don't really follow it fully, but um, they're also trying to get a modified eggplant to be approved in India. Is that true? And it, are the is oh, the yeah. government susceptible to the um, the activist notions uh, over there as well? And is that, is that holding oh, it's, them up? Oh, it's horrible. The BT eggplant was approved all the way up through India's regulatory agencies, and the prime minister said, "Uh, uh-uh. uh." Um, so at the highest level, they said no. The uh, agriculture minister in in uh, in um, Bangladesh next door, you know, uh, million thirty five million people on a postage stamp, said, "I want this technology for my citizens and my in my um, environment." And uh, she is a very you know very small woman, but very well trained, and she uh, <laughs> she approved it. And it started out with a handful of farms, had tremendous results. They went from hundreds of sprays of very potent chemicals, old school stuff we don't use in this in North America, um, to maybe one or two sprays a year. And farmers realized the benefits. And this was, again, the genetically engineered to resist insects. So now they had these beautiful eggplants they could sell at the market. They weren't covered in a residue of haze of um of uh insecticide and if you want to see a great video on this look out look up well fed by a guy named hitty borsma he's a dutch filmmaker who's also a molecular biologist and it is so much worth your time he goes yeah well fed he goes to bangladesh and actually sees this happen and um was this just this past year or how recent was the um bangladesh uh uh, it's it, it's in its uh, I think the first ones were 2014, oh, okay. and right right now and the best part about it is you can buy the seeds from the company, or you can keep the seeds and give them to your neighbor, give them to your friends, and the seeds are everywhere. This year it's estimated that there are 20,000 farmers growing BT eggplant, and eggplant's not like it is for us where you put it on a sandwich with Parmesan cheese and pizza sauce. Over there, it's the cornerstone of the diet. And um, it's now apparently, and I don't know where I get this information from, Mark Linus is a great resource. I believe it has actually found its way into India through smuggling channels because everybody wants it. And India is gradually turning its policy to consider it, and it will be approved in the Philippines this year. So this is a great example of a genetically engineered technology created by a com- by a country, not a company, that is serving the poorest, most food insecure people in the world, and having tremendous, tremendous impact. And I don't know an activist on this world that wants to lay in front of that that steamroller. Right. Do you think that? Um, I mean, I guess you hope, but do you believe that more countries will f- see these examples as successes and sort of follow suit and not succumb to the? Because you see these uh, in other countries too. There's a lot of um, riots and different things when when these new uh, crops get approved. I think I think Ecuador. We spoke about Ecuador last time mm-hmm. you were on the show a bit, but I think there was some protests there recently too. 
Oh, sure. Um, and, and and I get that. I mean, there are, and the problem is a lot of the uh, protests are orchestrated by NGOs from the states and the EU because they realize this is the first domino and it's falling. And if Greenpeace and Friends of the Earth and USRTK and, uh, you know, all these other organizations, uh, Center for uh, Food uh, Safety, if they're going to continue to make up misinformation and have it believed, they have to make sure the story of the successes are squashed and uh, squashed. And I'm talking about <laughs> um, there. Um, uh, when you look at the. Uh, rhetoric around these organizations they say the bt brinjal the eggplant is a complete failure but it's a resounding success and it points out um really how how fraudulent these organizations are and they're losing it Mm -hmm. they're losing that battle and and you know the first domino is falling and i think they're you're going to see more and more noise around uh feeding the food insecure because this is their Achilles heel. When they, when people start realizing that these organizations that claim to be the, 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 on the righteous ones are actually the ones who are, are keeping food out of the mouths of people. We need to feed the world and GM technology is helping us do that. Well, it's Um, one little part of that, right? It's one little part. Right. And that, in that each one of these technologies has a niche. And as communicators, that's what we need to share, that every one of these technologies can solve a problem for some people. And it's not a panacea. It's not a cure-all. But, man, when we put it into place where it works, it works well. Great. Okay, Kevin. Well, thanks again for uh, appearing the, your second time on the Decast podcast uh, in full video. And, um yeah, where can uh, people find you? Tell us uh, what you got going on. You got the Talking Biotech podcast, of course. Yeah, Talking Biotech Podcast is on its 172nd episode or something. It's fantastic. Um, I love it more all the time. And I'm not just saying it because it's me. I love the guests. And uh, they're they're so much fun. Um, I'm on Twitter, at Kevin Fulta, and you can do a Google search. But <laughs> be careful. Be careful. What um, it, yeah. it, I, I, um, I am Google dead. Um, I've been destroyed by activists to the point where um, a Google search, you wouldn't hire me to uh, <laughs> watch your kids pave your driveway or walk your dog. <laughs> I mean, I am I am dead in social media. So, you know, uh, be good filters, listen to the podcast, listen to people that matter, and, um, you know, and, and go out and fight for what's right because it's worth it. Appreciate it. Well, maybe we'll write some blogs or we'll get the listeners to make some web pages that are nice to you and then you'll climb back up on the Google rankings. (laughs) We'll get there. (laughs) Okay. Thanks again.